it's uh, uh, a wonderful gathering here this evening. Uh, I would ask all of you to sit comfortably. If you want to sit meditation, uh, you don't have to put your hands in Anjali. Just sit comfortably, relaxed. You can, if you want to, close your eyes uh, to meditate and listen with your ears and your heart. Achan Cha, uh, my meditation teacher, Achan Jandi's meditation teacher, uh, taught us always to listen with our ears so we're understanding the words that are being said, but also listen with our heart so that we take those words in and hopefully those words will calm us down, will lead us to a sense of well-being and also an understanding because the Dhamma talk is pointing to practical ways of how to apply the Buddha's teachings in our daily life. And we realize that the, the way the Buddha taught the Dhamma was very pragmatic. It was to analyze human existence and see what is the reality of human existence, not what we want it to be, not what we wish it to be, not what we idolize it to be, but what is its very nature. And through that watching the very nature of the human existence, he saw there was birth, old age, sickness and passing away. And there was the getting of what we don't want in life and not getting what we want in life. And then the changeability of what we call the five khandhas, the body, feeling, perception, thought and consciousness is always changing. And because of that constant instability and change of the five characteristics of existence of a human being and also the external world, uh, the qualities of the earth, the nature of phenomena is always arising and disintegrating. Then he saw that basically to find some perfection, some ideal in the world was not possible. There had to be something which was beyond the world, which was ideal. And from that we know that the Buddha strove to realize that ideal, and he did. That is Nibbāna, enlightenment. So our aspirations as, as Buddhists is to have the greater aspiration to incline towards the ending of problems, difficulties and suffering and aspire to the noble release, freedom, the ending of suffering, what we call enlightenment. And the Buddha taught a very practical and pragmatic pathway to realizing that. We know the, the Noble Eightfold Path from right view up to uh, right concentration or samadhiti up to samasamadhi. So this evening I want to maybe just summarize the, the Noble Eightfold Path into its three uh, main elements virtue, uh, meditation and wisdom so that it's something you can take away and apply especially in your daily life because sometimes uh, people find uh, that they have the idea that religion or their spiritual path is somehow alien to their daily life and so I will try to make it relevant uh, here uh, for all of you. And so, you know, we begin by the whole discussion of virtue. You know, the five precepts the Buddha said is the foundation of a virtuous person because what one is doing is reframing from any unwholesome action of body and speech. And we all know the five precepts of you know, Pāna, Tibhāta, Adhinā, Dāna, Kāme, Musa and Sura is 
inclining to refrain from harmful, hurtful, killing actions that are harm and hurt other beings, refraining from stealing, uh, staying from sexual misconduct, refraining from wrong speech, harsh speech, frivolous speech, and gossip, refraining uh, from drugs and intoxicants that uh, destroy mindfulness and awareness, lead to carelessness and heedlessness. So what we're practicing when we do take on this reframing is putting boundaries on our actions and speech, which is the basis of ethics. And in Buddhist morality and Buddhist ethics, it is to never harm oneself and never harm any other living being. So our morality is based in not harming oneself nor harming other beings. And the Buddha actually said that if a person wants to have compassion, and we hear this word used often in Buddhist circles, you know, to have great compassion, the quality of a, 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 an ideal bodhisattva is to have immeasurable compassion, great compassion. The Buddha in the suttas, the discourses, describe someone who has real compassion as someone who keeps the five precepts. So if you want to have uh, universal compassion for yourself and all other beings, then one needs to be well established in the five precepts. He gives a discourse where he says that a person who does not kill, does not intentionally harm any other being, even from you know, the human being to the smallest creature, uh, the insect, the mosquito or the ant, if you do not intentionally kill those beings, then you're giving compassion to all other beings that they lose their fear of you, that you will harm and hurt them. So it's an act of compassion and kindness that you're giving to the world by reframing from harmful action of your body and hurting them, then you give them freedom from fear that you hurt them. And that is a gift to beings in the world. That is great compassion. When you refrain from taking what is not given, uh, then you're giving beings freedom from fear that you'll steal or take what belongs to them, that you'll be fraudulent, that you'll take advantage of them uh, in your business dealings, in your tax accounting, in your uh, interaction with other beings, you won't take what is not rightfully, lawfully and justly given. And so you're giving those be beings freedom from fear that this is a person they can rely on and trust. So you're giving them trust by giving yourself integrity and honesty. And to give beings freedom from fear that you will destroy their emotional relationships uh, with their, their husband, their wife, their children, their, their companions and partners by not committing adultery, taking advantage sexually uh, of other people, other beings in this world, then you're giving beings freedom from fear of you, that you're exploiting them, abusing them for your physical gratification. And then if one keeps the fourth precept, right speech, then you're giving beings freedom from fear that you will lie to them, deceive them, be fraudulent with your speech. They can trust you. They can treat you with integrity. They can rely on you. You're giving them freedom from fear that you'll use abusive speech and hurt them and harm them through your speech. And you're giving them freedom from fear that you'll gossip about them, pull them down behind their back, hurt them through unkind speech. And then you're giving them freedom from fear uh, that you're just going to be talking nonsense, wasting their time uh, with careless speech, frivolous speech, speech that is not based in anything skillful and useful. 
And of course, the last one is giving beings freedom from fear that you're going to be under the influence of drugs and intoxicants, which is leading to carelessness and heedlessness. I have taught uh, Buddhism in prisons in uh, the West, in Australia, and at that time uh, there was a statistics that something like 73% of people who were incarcerated had been incarcerated because they were under the influence at the time they committed an offence and broke the law of drugs or intoxicants. So that, in 73% of the cases, was one of the causes of taking alcohol and drugs, was one of the causes for them to be careless about the other precepts and therefore injure themselves and injure others, hurt and abuse themselves and take advantage of themselves and others. And that is a cause for their suffering. So one is giving beings freedom of fear that if you're not taking drugs and toxins, you're going to be more mindful on the roads, you're going to be more careful in your behaviour, in your interactions. There's not going to be uh, aggression and violence, for example, uh, will be greatly reduced in our societies because one is compassionate on beings by being aware, mindful, taking responsibility of what you put into your body. And I want to actually bring something a bit more uh, modern to the five precepts because the other day I was talking to uh, two individuals and one of them was uh, a, a lady who spoke to me about um, her friends who are using the internet and in Thailand it's very popular, I don't know if it's the same here in Singapore, I see a lot of people here using their mobile phones even while the monks are giving talks and, and, and so it's become quite an obsession in our society and she was saying that her, all her friends are online. I've never been online, I don't know what online is, but she said that um, they use this line and so it's a way of keeping contact with a group of friends. But she said that a lot of her friends are Dhamma practitioners but she was really surprised by once they get online and they're not in the vision of the monks, they're not in the monastery, they're in the privacy of their own life and they get online to their friends that sometimes they get very heedless with their speech online. It's the printed word. And she found that when they, especially when they were talking about say politics, or particular political issues or things that are happening in the news that they sometimes get very, very careless, heedless with their right speech. And so it is important to point out that the Buddha does talk about right speech is also the written word. For example, in the monk's rules, it's not what we say that is also uh, is only an offence if we write something which is not true, if we uh, write something that is using harsh speech or abusive speech, if we write something which is gossip, and online often there's gossip, if we write something that's frivolous, then that is wrong speech. That is a comma action that one has done, a comic action that one has done. So uh, it's, she asked me, could I give uh, some talks to, you know, when I speak on Buddhism, to bring the five precepts into how people are using technology? Because sometimes this is not an area which people are maybe thinking about. They tend to uh, forget that when they write something online or print something online and send it off into cyberspace, they forget about the consequences because it's not like the person is in front of you. You can't see the emotional reaction that your actions and words have. 
But as we all know, and I'm sure you're more aware than even I am, the impact that unskillful speech, harsh speech, careless speech can have on people's lives, criticism, negativity, and the uh, reactions and very dramatic reactions that people can have to opinions and views on the internet and online can have even serious consequences to people's lives. And I've heard of cases of young people committing suicide even because they have been criticized, abused on Facebook, internet, uh, Twitter, etc., etc. So I would like to, you know, as obviously Singapore is you know, really at the forefront of IT and technical development, we need as Buddhists to bring the five precepts into this whole area as well and not forget that. This is something where we think of the Buddhist teachings as sometimes an ancient tradition 2,600 years ago that the Buddha taught these teachings, but these teachings have to be brought in to our actions here and now, in this time and this place. So what is you know, killing online? What is killing on the internet? And we see that actually if you hack somebody else's website, you can destroy uh, computer systems, you can destroy somebody's hard work, you can, uh, in computer games, your children sometimes spend their whole time playing a computer game which is killing. Even though it's a non-human being, the perception in the children is sometimes in that computer game that they're playing very violent. They perceive that as a being and they're shooting them down. That perception and the attention to kill is still karma. Uh, it's not obviously the same karmic uh, consequences as killing a living being because they have the perception, uh, they understand that this is a game, but they have the perception that this is a character and they're going to shoot them. So some of the qualities of killing are there, not all the qualities. It's not a living being, but the intention is to destroy. And there's the act, the effort to destroy. And there's the outcome that that character is destroyed. But it is not a real living being. But still, some of the mental qualities of killing are still there. So it is still kamma not obviously the full karmic consequences of killing a living being, obviously that, but some of the characteristics. And we know uh, from the Buddha's teachings that if we develop conditioned behavior, of course they all the scientists and the best kind of uh, uh, People in uh, psychology will say, well, there's no direct evidence that playing computer games makes you more violent. That's because they haven't understood the law of consequences. The Buddha said, a fully enlightened Buddha said, cause and effect. If you repeat a behavior repetitively over and over again, that is creating the causes. There will be consequences. And maybe because the computer games are relatively new, we just haven't seen all the consequences that are going to come out in 10 years' time, 20 years' time, 50 years' time, 100 years' time down the line, if people continue along that line. So this is something that we can actually bring the five precepts to uh, and apply that, that the non-stealing, uh, is we can see that in the, uh, the IT world, and this is very interesting, I was speaking, the other person I was speaking to was uh, um, the head, he was the deputy head of the DSI in Thailand. Uh, the DSI is equivalent to the FBI, um, the, the kind of police investigative unit in Thailand, and he is, was the deputy head 
of DSI, and his specialty was on computer crime. But he's a very devout Buddhist, and he came to see me at the monastery the other day, and he was talking about the five precepts in terms of IT. And he is the one who gave me the idea for this, some of the things I'm saying this evening. And so, so I'm not stealing his ideas, I specifically asked him. That's a very good uh, concept of bringing the five precepts into uh, IT. Can I use what you've said and uh, uh, quote you? And he said, yes, I give you permission. So what I'm saying now has not been stolen. So I want to give him kind of reference and appreciation. And the reason I say that is because one of the things he said is, you know, not stealing is not to use methodologies uh, in the computer world where you're, say, using fraud. Uh, you're taking advantage of people on a computer to get finance from them through scams and schemes and uh, ringing people up and saying they've won a million dollars but they have to send a hundred thousand dollars to you first uh, and then send it off to some strange country uh, overseas. You know, some, so many people are taken in by greed and desire and so if we keep the five precepts and we also bring that into that realm, that world and we see that one of the big problems on in the internet and modern society is virtue has sometimes not transferred into the uh, IT realm. Sometimes it's not gone in uh, to cyberspace and the way people use that space in their lives. And that's as Buddhists we need to start to think of how is the five precepts relevant to how I use my time, how I interact, how I behave in this new realm, this new phenomenon, which is growing and becoming more uh, a part of our everyday life. And, and then also uh, one of the things that he mentioned was when he gives speaks about, uh, speeches about um, the five precepts and the internet is this whole concept of uh, uh, not committing adultery is what the Kame Sumichatara Weeramani is not getting involved in proliferating pornography, in abusive behavior, in uh, adultery, adultery behavior on the internet, encouraging websites that lead to the destruction of loving relationships uh, that encourage uh, taking advantage of people's marriages and, uh, and then having relationships outside of that. This is the whole realm that we can avoid by someone who is keeping virtuous behavior in their daily life but also on these realms that sometimes in the privacy of a room when no one is watching us, that's when we have to be very mindful we have to be very aware that we are seeing ourselves. How are we behaving? How are we reacting? How are we interacting? How are we taking in information and putting out information? That's actually very important. And the other thing that, of course, is a right speech is not to get in, as I said, uh, lying speech, fraudulent speech, abusive speech, frivolous speech, and destructive speech uh, on these social networking sites uh, and our interaction with other people because there's always a person on the end of that, that site, uh, someone who's going to read that email, read that uh, web, read that blog and these can be uh, very destructive and can go very quickly and so to be mindful and reflective when we press the click button to send, uh, to should we maybe put it aside for a, a day and read it again tomorrow morning uh, before we send that you know kind of uh, opinion, that view off into what we call cyberspace. We think it's going off just into the ether, but it actually has a direct impact on somebody else's life in many cases. 
and then also uh, the concept of non uh, not taking drugs and intoxicants, how do we take that into the IT realm, which means using the internet, using cyberspace in a non-addictive way. Some people, and it's a big problem for many parents that I speak to, their children are addicted to computer games, their children are addicted to the internet, computer, uh, their children are addicted to social media and keeping in contact with their friends so much so that you see parents and children sitting together at a table at a, at a restaurant and the parents are on the mobile phone and the children are on the mobile phone. And there's uh, not the social interaction as a family, as a community, but there is this interaction with the machine. And this is becoming a huge problem, and I'm not just saying that in here in Singapore, it's a huge problem in Thailand. Um, it's becoming to the point where, for example, in Thailand at my monastery, I now say that uh, society has changed so much from when I first came to Thailand as a young monk. When I first visited and went to Thailand in 1978 to become a monk, people, if they saw a monk, would squat down and put their hands in Anjali very respectfully. Uh, now that is changed. Now when they see a monk, they go, check, check, check. <laughs> so we've become pra check. Uh, the photographed monks, yes. And so people, when they see a monk, they immediately want to take a photograph. And today, actually, we, um, we were out and uh, about having a look at Singapore, looking at the nature of Singapore, and uh, I had a lot of tourists come up and say, can I take your photograph? And I decided I wasn't going to be Prachak here in Singapore. So we said politely no. And, uh, but that's become a part of the culture now. People are forgetting. And the other day I was on arms round in, the, uh, in my monastery and there was a lady, the first time she'd come to the monastery, and she was uh, in a rush. She wanted to take a photograph of the monks, but the monks had already come up to her with their arms bowl, and she went to put uh, food into the monk's bowl, and she was holding her uh, iPhone, and it dropped into the bowl. <laughs> and I was very tempted to close my bowl and walk <laughs> off. Uh, not because I wanted to take what belonged to her, but maybe then I could give her a Dhamma talk, <laughs> yes. And uh, I had a group of uh, doctors and nurses come to my monastery and uh, they came to the uh, front gate and they took a picture of the front gate. They came uh, to the entrance of the hall and they took a picture of the entrance of the hall standing in a group and then they saw the sign uh, for the meditation hall, uh, which is the devotion to the Buddha meditation hall. And they all stood and took a picture in front of the meditation hall. And then they came up and saw me and said, can we take a picture of you? And I, I said, just one moment, where are you from? And they said, we're from a hospital. I won't tell you where the hospital is. I, it's a public talk. Uh, uh, I'm fr we're from a hospital in Korat, in the Konrajasima and we're doctors and nurses. And so I said to them, if I go to the hospital and I'm not well, and I see a very beautiful hospital and I take a picture in front of the hospital, and I take a picture in front of the sign of the hospital, and then I see the doctor and I ask to take a picture with the doctor, <laughs> and then I meet the nurses and I ask to take a picture with the nurses, and then I come back to the monastery. Will I recover from my illness? <laughs> and they said, no, venerable sir, you won't recover from your illness. And I said, why? Because you didn't come and uh, speak with the doctor, uh, discuss your symptoms, uh, get some analysis, get some investigative x-rays, etc. Find out what's wrong with you. And then the doctor 
figure a treatment and give you a course of treatment and give you the medicine to take away. Uh, and take that course of treatment and take that treatment and consume that course of treatment till its end, then come back and see the doctor and tell them the results. And I said, yes. So if you take a picture in front of my monastery, uh, in front of the sign of the monastery, with the monks, will you get beyond your suffering? No, Venerable Sir. What you have to do then is come, speak to the monk, hear the Buddha's treatment for you. Take the Buddha's treatment away and have it as a course of treatment. Use that treatment to the completion of the course. No shortcuts. Not trying to take all the medicine at once or taking a short a session of the treatment, but completing the course of treatment, and then you'll see for yourself the decreasing of suffering, the inclining away from suffering, the ending of problems, the ending of difficulties, the freedom from dis-ease. And they said, oh, sadhu, 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 and then they said, now can we take a photograph? <laughs> So I'm telling you that because after the meeting I'm expecting somebody to say, can we take a photograph with all the monks here? Um, but we see that, that this process of the Buddhist teachings is a process and we have to apply that process. And we can be coming to a centre like this and then coming listening to a talk but then not going away and actually taking, taking that treatment that the Buddha prescribed and applying it in our daily life. And that's what we need to do. That's when we take the Dhamma and make it a refuge for us. And that we take the Dhamma and actually make it a, an, an island uh, for us. That's why um, Kun, uh, Sebastian Wong actually said in the introduction there, that uh, we set up this center. That's the external center which we come to, like the external hospital, we visit the doctor, but when we receive the Dhamma, the treatment, the medicine, we have to take that medicine away and turn it inwards into our hearts. So the real uh, abiding of the Dhamma is in our own hearts. We see and know those truths for ourselves. And so, you know, I, I mentioned the five precepts. Obviously, I haven't talked about all the aspects of five precepts. I wanted to just focus on this aspect of, you know, IT, cyberspace, and how we can, as modern Buddhists, don't think that Buddhism is just a traditional religion. It's about the here and now. How do we apply those five precepts in daily life that we're using right here and right now, and I have taken this idea that was given to me by the gentleman who came to my monastery from the DSI, and I thought it was very practical and very important to, to convey to Buddhist groups uh, this concept of the five precepts and modern technology. And so then, of course, we have uh, the other aspect of the Buddhist teachings is, you know, sila samadhi and panya. And so samadhi, what does that mean? You know, samadhi means to, to calm and be peaceful and to calm things down, then bring them to stillness and ultimately bring them to one-pointedness, our minds to one-pointedness. And so how do we calm our lives down first? Uh, one of the things is to firstly realize that how much uh, we're putting in to our minds that is unnecessary and agitating, and then how much of that we can actually maybe take out, how much extra are you adding on in terms of burdens and responsibilities. And so it's actually important. Uh, we have very busy lives very dramatic lives, many of you are, have you know, great responsibilities, then actually how do we make our minds 
more calm and more peaceful. And it's very interesting that one way to do it is actually to start to notice when it's not busy or where it's not busy. Just yesterday uh, in the evening, uh, we were taken uh, to, to have a view of the uh, Singapore from a, a high vantage point. And as we were waiting uh, to go up, it was a very crowded and busy area and uh, the monks sat quietly uh, to one side in a, in a nice cool garden area as we were waiting for the lay people to arrange to, to, to take the elevator. And uh, there was a lot of people coming and going. And this is a very busy, uh, noisy environment which us as monks from the forest are not used to. What I did was instead of watching the people and the activity, was watch the space and the silence. So you're taking a busy, noisy environment and turning it into a quiet environment because of your perception. And Ajahn Chah uh, would use this as a, a, an example. For example, all of us here have come to this center today at Wat Bali Lai. When we come here, you see the Buddha image, you see the monks, you see all the people, you see the cameras, uh, you see the lights and all the things around us. Some people might think that what Bali Lai is very busy. There's a lot going on and that makes them agitated. But actually, the biggest thing in this whole is space is the emptiness around us. But very few people ever notice the space in this hall. If we come into this hall and just notice the Buddha image, then we can start thinking this is a very inspiring Buddha image, uh, I like this Buddha image, or I prefer a different type of Buddha image. You know, the mind can start thinking about the Buddha image. You see the monks, then your mind starts thinking about where do they come from, who are they, can they speak English, and will the talk be relevant to me tonight. The mind starts thinking. If you see the people, I know this person, I've got business with that one, I'll chat with that one afterwards. The mind starts thinking. You're not peaceful. But if you come into this hall, you see all those things but that's not where you place your attention. You place your attention on that which is the greatest, the emptiness, the air, the space in this hole. What happens when you notice the space? Do you start thinking, I like it, I dislike it, I've got business after the talk to deal with this space? I've, it's big, it's small, or does noticing the space in this room make you more quiet, more still? Does it withdraw you from the activity of everything else, thinking about everything else, interacting with everything else, responding to everything else? Yes, it does. When we start to notice the space, then we notice that actually there's nothing really to decide, to think about, to worry about, to interact with. It's completely still. It's neutral. It's empty. Therefore, we can start to see that in our lives, if we just notice everything that's going on, we'll get very disturbed, stressed, and upset, worried. But when we start to notice sometimes the space between activity, the space around 
activity, the space around things, we can become more peaceful. And that is one of the qualities. The Buddha gave a very interesting discourse. It's called the Chula Sunyata Sutta, the discourse, the lesser discourse on emptiness. He gave two discourses in the Majjhima Nikaya, the Chula Sunyata Sutta and the Maha Sunyata Sutta, the greater discourse on emptiness. And in the uh, lesser discourse on emptiness, it's very interesting. He actually describes this process. So what I've just talked about and from Ajahn Chah's teachings is actually from the suttas, where the, the Buddha talks to the monks, and he says uh, to the monks, if a monk wants to turn his mind to emptiness, then what he begins with is the external world. For example, and this discourse was given in the Jetavana, uh, where the Buddha spent 19 rains retreats. It was one of his favorite abodes, and maybe some of the Buddhists here have been to India and visited the Jetavana. Um, it's a very beautiful monastery even now. And the Buddha said, many people would come to visit the Buddha at the Jetavana. And he said, monks, this talk was obviously given after the, the, the crowds had left. He said, monks, just as the Jetavana now is free of the crowds of lay people, free of elephants, because the kings would ride elephants, free of horses, free of, free of chariots, free of distractions and noise. Uh, if a monk thinks in his mind, it is wonderful, it is marvelous that this Jetavana is free of all these disturbances. Then there's a sense of joy and happiness arises in him because he sees the emptiness of those certain degrees of distraction. But there is still obviously certain distractions. That is the distractions of what you see, the trees, the monks, the environment around you. Then if the monk closes his eyes and turns his mind to the breath meditation, when he closes his eyes, just as you close your eyes now, then you see, or don't see, sorry, you see with your mind's eye, the Buddha is saying, that this environment is empty now of other people because we're not seeing them with their eyes. There is just this degree of disturbance through hearing, through feeling, through thought and perception, consciousness. But we have become free of the disturbance of eyesight so there's a certain degree of calm, of samadhi that has arisen, peacefulness that has arisen, because we've closed our eyes. And then when we watch the breath, we're watching one in-breath and one out-breath going in and out, there is a certain degree of freedom from distraction, activity, distractive thought, activity of body. There is this peace of the freedom from those activities. And so progressively the Buddha gets us to follow the meditation object to the point where the mind is free of the five hindrances and one notices the joy, the peace of being free from them. And it's very interesting in this discourse that the Buddha progressively inclines the mind of the monks to go into concentration and samadhi by giving up the five hindrances of sensual pleasure, of, of ill will, of doubt, of sloth and torpor, of restlessness and worry, giving those up and concentrating on one in-breath and one out-breath, that one is free from something. One is, the mind is empty from that, released from that. 
then the mind goes further in and concentrates on the breath so that one is then free from painful feeling in the body. One is then free from what we call vitaka vichara, applied application and sustained application of mind. There is only just piti, sukha and ekakata, the happiness and joy and one-pointedness of mind. Then one releases the mind from joy and there is just happiness and one-pointedness of mind and equanimity. Then one is free from hap uh, happiness, there is just equanimity, one-pointedness of mind. This the Buddha called emptiness, inclining towards the empty, more empty state of mind. Now how do we bring this into our daily life? Just as I said, to start to try and notice when you're actually free of burdens and rejoice and be happy that you're free of burdens. For example, you've come here tonight, you're free of the burden of work. It is wonderful, it is marvellous to be free of the burden of work. To just have this degree of disturbance of having to sit here and be in this environment, this positive environment, wholesome state. Yes, it's certainly still activity, but it is a joyous activity, more than having responsibilities. One is also, as you come here, free of the burden of social interaction, free of the burden of many of your family responsibilities. To actually see that, okay, at this point in time, I'm actually free of that. Yes, I have to go and pick that up, but actually to find a sense of release and freedom and contentment in putting it down and being aware that you've put it down. Because some people uh, have a sense of responsibility even then when they've put it down. So they come to a Buddha center like this and instead of rejoicing in being free of the burden of work, they come and sit meditation here and think, tomorrow, what do I have to do tomorrow? I've got a meeting at this time and then I've got to arrange, I've got this problem at work and then my boss you know, has given me a problem and then I want a wage ra a raise and uh, what am I going to do? <clears throat> and then they come back uh, here or the Buddha Center and they're thinking about all their work. This is not the time to carry the burden of work. This is the time to put it down. They're not going to pay you overtime. If they pay you overtime by sitting here in Wat Bali Lai, then think about work. If they're not going to pay you overtime, put it down. And so we actually, the way to put it down is actually to see it. This is burdensome. This is not the time to be worried about that. This is not the time to carry that burden. Uh, because if we d carry that burden for a long time, Ajahn Chah would compare that. If we pick this glass up, if I pick this glass up and take a drink, and then hold on to this glass through the rest of this talk, is that very smart? No, because if I hold the glass for you know, five seconds, it's not very happy, five minutes, it gets a bit weighty, five hours, that's crazy, that's painful. Five days, I'll be dead, <laughs> yes? But that's actually happening in our lives, isn't it? We're actually not picking things up, using them, and then placing them down. The letting go of burdens is very important, to be free of that. Of course, I look after this glass because it's very useful for myself and everybody else here. It belongs to somebody else, so I have to look after it. I use it, make sure it's clean, make sure it's put away, make sure it's protected, so it can be useful for the long term. Letting go is not throwing away. Letting go is not being heedless. Letting no, go is not smashing things. It is knowing what is beneficial wisely and skillfully. 
making use of that and then putting it down. When it's necessary to pick it up again, making use of that, putting it down. So when we start to let go of things, then we find we start to get more peaceful. And that is the other aspect of the Buddha's teachings. You know, this path, a path I mentioned to samadhi, it obviously leads to samma samadhi in the Buddha's teachings, which is there are very refined states of consciousness, which is going to be the culmination of the Noble Eightfold Path. And when we have refined states of inner happiness, inner clarity, inner peace, uh, we have great energy of the mind, the mind is very purified, then we start to see reality much more clearly. We can start to see problems more clearly and then understand them and put them down. And so I want to maybe not talk about ultimate wisdom which leads to Nibbana, obviously that's our goal, but I want to maybe uh, talk about something that came to me this morning when I, I came to Wat Bali Lai uh, this morning for the meal. It was a, quite a large gathering for the meal. It was very impressive. I'm seeing it's a Monday. Um, and I noticed many people come up to the, the shrine of the Brahma, a deity we have here. And in Buddhism, we have great respect to Brahma because Brahma was the, per, the, the deity who invited the Buddha to teach the Dhamma. Uh, the Buddha was inclined not to teach the Dhamma because he thought human beings have much dust in their eyes and they won't want to listen to the Dhamma. The Dhamma is very refined. But uh, Brahma requested uh, the Lord Buddha to teach the Dhamma for those who have little dust in their eyes. And it's because of Brahma that we can hear the Dhamma to this day. So we have respect to the deities and devas. But uh, when I saw people coming to this morning to uh, offer dana and many people coming and then coming up to the image of Brahma there, I'm not sure they were necessarily thinking uh, how grateful they are to the Brahma uh, for developing and teaching the Brahma Viharas, uh, those qualities that lead to Brahma, and uh, for inviting the Buddha to teach the Dhamma. I think maybe a lot of people were saying, please can my uh, children pass their exams uh, please can I get a promotion at work? Uh, may I overcome uh, the problems I'm having uh, at home or elsewhere? And it was, you know, this is my projection. Maybe uh, I'm, I'm wrong, but often that's the case in my experience in, in Thailand, that people are turning to deities to wish for something. And so what I what I uh, often say to people is um, which is the more or which is closer to right view which has more right view a person who gets up in the morning and comes to Wat Bali Lai to bow down to the Buddha image or bow uh, pay respects to the Brahma image and request uh, Lord Buddha, uh, refuges of the Triple Gem, or Brahma, and the deities, all the deities, may you make my life peaceful today. May I have no problems today. May everything go well today. May I only have happiness and success today. May I never experience any difficulties, problems, and suffering in this life forevermore. That's one person. Or somebody else who comes to Wat Bali Lai in the morning and bows down to the Buddha image, and pays respects in Anjali to the Brahma image and thinks uh, the Buddha, invited by Brahma, taught the Dhamma to beings in the world. He taught suffering, the cause of suffering, the liberation from suffering and the path to the liberation of suffering. He taught that all conditioned phenomena, sabere sankara dukkha, all conditioned phenomena is suffering. Today, I know there will be suffering because that is the truth that the Buddha saw. But may I face that suffering and may the Buddha be my witness and Brahma be my witness that I will try and endeavor to face that suffering with wisdom, with 
virtue with mindfulness and awareness to the best of my ability so I reduce that suffering, overcome that suffering, renounce that suffering, abandon that suffering, give up that suffering and not cause any other suffering to myself or others. Which one are you? Are you the person who comes to what Bali Lai and says, Oh, and dear Buddha, may you bless my life and, and bless my wife, bless my children, bless my job, give me everything I want, make everything happy and wonderful and marvellous. May you give me utopia here and now, yes, and no problems ever. I don't want to hear about suffering. <clears throat> or are you the person who has taken the Buddha's teachings into your heart and then realized, yes, I, not, I need to incline my, my view, my attitude in life so it is in line with the Buddha, so it is in line with the enlightened ones, the ones who know. I may not yet see that all life is suffering, but a Buddha who knows saw that. I may not want it to be suffering, but a Buddha who knows says that's the way it is. I will take on faith. I see a certain amount of suffering in life, and I'll take it on faith. There is much more that I have not seen and known. But may I strive in this day, in this moment, in every moment of my awareness in this day to overcome my suffering through virtue, through peacefulness and through wisdom to the best of my ability so that I do not increase suffering within myself and do not increase suffering within others and in my family, in my work, in my society, in this country, in this world. If one thinks like that, then one is inclining to the right view of the noble ones, inclining and applying the teachings of the Buddha in your daily life. So I would like to give you this medicine as a way, a methodology to incline, to develop wisdom. Wisdom is the result. This is the discerning ability of how to cultivate wisdom to incline away from those qualities that increase suffering and increase those qualities that bring happiness, bring peace, bring stillness, bring compassion and bring the ending of suffering in your lives and the lives of others. So I think I have uh, spoken enough for this evening and I'd like to end the talk here and now. I'm not sure if we're having a question and answers after this, but uh, I haven't been watching the time. Uh, 